Welcome to the J-Boy Show, hosted by Jake Crane, the fastest growing sports show in the nation. I'm Coach Hugh Freeze. This is Super Bowl champion Brandon Graham. Hey, this is DJ Shockley, and you're watching. And you're watching. And thanks for watching the J-Boy Show. Hello, everybody. Thanks for hopping in again on another edition of the J-Boy Show. Uh, really excited. We're in person in the studio with a guy that's came on the show before, and it's actually the first time we've ever met in person, believe it or not. I'm going to get to our guests in a second, but first, as usual, got to give a shout out to betonline.ag. Head over there today. The online casino is always open. Whether you like parlays, teasers, pleasers, props, player props, uh, really hitting Giannis hard in these uh, playoffs. Had him over 47 and a half the other day. He hit it by the third quarter. Love the individual player props in the NBA playoffs. But head, head over to betonline.ag today and tell them that J-Boy sent you. But, uh, you know, a guy, you trust the scoop. Uh, Philip Dukes from Dukes the Scoop. First time, uh, you know, me and you, I feel like I, you know, know you super well as much as we talk. It's the first time uh, in person, man. I'm just really excited to get you here. Uh, hey, I appreciate it, man. I'm like super proud of you. So just imagine like the first phone calls we had, like, you know, what? like, man, like, what? like the, the, the stuff we did, like in a year's time and just to see how you progress, man, it, it, it really does my heart good. Like no BS. Like, so I'm super proud of you, man. Thanks oh, for and, having me. Oh, well, you know that man. And, and you know, the love I got for you and, and how well trust the scoop is. And you've got your hands in a ton of different things and, and had a bunch of success lately. lately and I want to get into that. Uh, but Dukes, I, I got to ask you, man, it's been a while since we've talked. Uh, just state of affairs right now uh, at Auburn, what you've seen from Brian Harson, you're a guy that's obviously very well connected uh, around it. But, you know, kind of what do you think just so far as, as we lead up to the season? I think Harson. so the way Harson came, right, we can just go all the way back. So yeah. we strike out on like Venables, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Harson, you get on the phone early that day and Harson calls, I mean, Green calls Harson. From what I heard, Harson like accepted the same night, like you know. But mm -hmm. I think that leverage that he had kind of set him up for what he wanted to do when he got to Auburn. So basically, I think Harson's deal was, I'm going to do it the Harson way. It's going to be yeah. my way, and the old way clearly wasn't working. So I'm going to do it my way. So you got to think about all the drama that was going on when Harson came along. You had the the coup, the backdoor stab, yeah, stop the, steal, right? Yeah, stop, stop, steal that whole nine. And there was some truth to that, from what I hear. But Harson's main thing was to make sure that the culture was going to be in place that where it could be repeatable. So yeah. I work in manufacturing and my whole life, as far as in my career, it, if you're good or you can get lucky and have a good day. Mm -hmm. But if you want to be great, you got to be able to make a cycle repeatable. Exactly. And I think that's what Harson came in to do is like, you know what? We got to blow it up. I mean, like and, and just look at some of the moves that he made. Like there was one coach retained on the staff. That was a statement right there. And it just so happens that the coach that was retained was the coach of a generational running back yeah. that he couldn't get in contact with, Best right? Best player on the team, hands down. Hands down. All right, so cool. Now, look, what I do like about Harson is I just don't think he cares what anybody thinks, yeah. right? And I, I think it's been so long since we've had that in Auburn that it's kind of refreshing. No disrespect to anybody who's been there in the past. No disrespect to Gus. Love Gus. I think he was a great person. But I think as far as what needed to be changed – I don't know, but I know we needed a change at that point. The relationship had gotten stale. Harson comes in, you know, and and he basically came in and started throwing his weight around. You won't have to be here. And there were a lot of guys, like even from the 04 team, 03, guys that I have a really good relationship with that weren't exactly thrilled about the way Harson handled some things, right? But I think Harson has done a good job of starting to uh, include the alumni now, right? Yeah. So now they're being included. There's a weekly call, a, a bi-weekly call, something like that, and where guys are start and they're they're starting to invite guys back to Auburn. So I think that's a really good thing because we didn't see a whole lot of former players on the sidelines in the past. So where you have like a Miami where you can just walk by at Miami, you may see uh, Edger and James working out. Mm -hmm. A lot of that wasn't really going on at Auburn in the past. So I think what Harson is doing is trying to rebrand Auburn to be a one team operation moving in the same way. May rub some people to write it the wrong way, but hey, that's what we got right now. No, and I, I mean, I think you bring up some great points. I mean, if you're a guy like Brian Harson, why would you not keep doing it your way? You're 69 and 19 coming in as a head coach, had a lot of success as a young guy, co-OC at Texas. We obviously know Boise State and, and some of the calls in those games with, with Chris Peterson at the helm. Uh, and, and bringing in a guy that's outside the box, and, and I've talked about this on the show multiple times, it's kind of different. And, and 
as a head coach, especially at a place like Auburn, uh, you have to embrace the former players. You right. have to because right. you don't want that synergy to be bad there. Now, that doesn't mean they have to be able to come in and, and do everything. But, you know, Brian Harson's the same guy that had an open practice during the spring. That's right. something at Auburn, the pass regime, like you could, it's probably a no fly zone <laughs> over Jordan Hare with, within a certain amount of time. And, and I think it's refreshing. Uh, and, you know, when you talk about style and, and you say that, you know, he really doesn't care what, what anybody else thinks. I think that's a strength when you can't be peer pressured into something. Cause like you said, you're trying to build a machine right. And right now. The biggest problem that Brian Harson's having to fix and he's done a good job in the transfer portal is roster management. And right. we all know how important that is. Nick Saban's unbelievable at it. Kirby's unbelievable at it. Davo's unbelievable at it. And outside of recruiting, it's the most important thing. How do you think uh, that Brian Harson has approached the roster so far through the transfer portal with some of the pickups, obviously defensively heavy? I think it kind of reminds me of how Tuberville kind of attacked the uh, JUCO ranks when he was there. I like that comp. So it's kind of like uh, so the Alton Moores, the Javar Mills, the defensive linemen that you saw where we where we didn't have that high school depth and some of the guys that came into high school that didn't pan out as the way we thought they would, you were able to backfill some of those, those positions until you got to a point where you could recruit high school level, uh, those four and five stars at the level that you wanted to. Mm -hmm. So I think that using um, – one of the biggest tools out there right now, which is the transfer portal, in order for them to backfill. Like, so the guy from Kansas, the defensive lineman. Now, Kansas, I don't think they won a game, right? Yeah, or, they, they were not very good. He actually can play. Yeah, he can. Right? So it's not about just saying, okay, like, so at Georgia, they'll go get the uh, the corner from uh, Clemson, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, Auburn, we didn't have a shot at that kid. So who do you get? Somebody who can make your team better, who can make a particular room better. So if you look at the D lineman room from last year to this year, even though we lost some key guys that we may have seen as far that, that we saw that we, that may have had some potential, now you're getting guys who have that fresh start and their first experience at Auburn is going to be the hearts and the way. And I think that's really important to start to build that culture and have, as you start to kind of just say, when you think Auburn, what do you think? Do you think a top five team in the SEC? Do you think a top 10 team in the country? What do you think? Or do you think, oh, uh, well, this is a place where I can come in and do what I want to do, and they're going to have to uh, acquiesce to me? That's not what's going on. You're going to do it the Harson way. And I think by going to get guys who already have experience and letting them see the Auburn way be the Harson way is going to be the way that we move into that next level of recruiting by being able to put a better product on the field. Because uh, you can say what you want to say. You win five games at Auburn, you're not going to get a sniff at a four or five star for the next three, four years, period, right? So if he can get these guys to come in and play this year and go ahead and kind of and get to the point where you can be that six, seven, eight win team and show that your system is working, I think that's going to be really important for turning things around at Auburn. No, I, I agree. And, and speaking about recruiting, you know, you have some people that – uh, aren't thrilled with the way that Brian Harson's gone about recruiting. Listen, you got to win on the field, like you said, to right. get these recruits in, in today's age. It's just the way recruiting is. It's tough when you haven't been able to play or coach a game and you're selling a vision. Once you're able to show them the vision, a lot of us are visual people, I would say most of us, then they really start believing you. Right. And, and not to say they haven't done a good job, but his philosophy, I mean, look at Boise State, and at a place like that, you almost have to be like this, is developmental. Getting guys that you project down the road right. uh, that can develop, and, and you think they're a good cultural fit, you think they're a good fit academically, you're not going to have to worry about the stuff off the field. Uh, and I know some, that rub, rubs some people the wrong way. And, and listen, you take all the five stars in the country, the odds of all of them busting aren't good, and the odds of you having great players is, but there's other ways to do it. What do you think about that philosophy, and do you think that's going to change if he starts having success on the field, as you kind of alluded to earlier? So I think that uh, – so just for me talking to, like, some coaches from around the area, so, you know, I've got relationships uh, uh, definitely with a lot of the trainers. Mm -hmm. And Harson hasn't been in contact with a lot of these four and five stars as much as they're seeing from other coaches. But you also have to understand that you have to – so let's, let's take Florida State, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Florida State has a horrible year last year, right? They start – and so they, they weren't really in it with a lot of the four and five star guys last year. What they did was say, you know what, from the time he got there, he started working that 22, 23, 24 yep. class. So now you're seeing a guy like a Travis Hunter. You're seeing Cam Davis, a 24 kid who's an absolute monster, already commit. And now they're saying, you know what, we're going to be the class that turns. We're going to be that, that group that turns Florida State back into Florida State. I think that what Harson is doing now is saying, you know what, on this year, hey, you know what, let's cut our losses. Let's get some guys yeah. that, that may be just as good as a four or a five star would be if they came today. How many four or five stars come in and dominate? Not really a lot of them. I don't even care if you're at Alabama. You still have to develop. So by being there, you can kind of 
I guess, kind of soften the blow yeah. of not getting those guys. Bridge this that year. gap a little bit. Absolutely. Of, of, of this year by getting some of those guys in. Now, once you start to focus on some of those guys, that 23 class, that 24 class, then uh, and you get those wins, I think you'll see Harson start to kind of blossom a little more as far as mm-hmm. building those relationships. Because you got to think, how hard it would it be? A lot of these guys have been recruited since they were 12 and 13 years old. Very true. You got a guy coming from Boise, Idaho. It's a million kids in College Park, Georgia, where I'm from right yeah. now that are like, what the f- is Boise? Yeah, it might as well be like, on, on Mars. <laughs> right. You, you get what I'm saying? So at this point, now Harson can say, let's build with Auburn first. OK, I'm going to put the product out there. And then once you become familiar with the new Auburn and I'm, I'm loving the graphics, they're doing some really cool things. Now, one of the graphics was a little iffy. We can talk yeah. about that. <laughs> one graphic was a little iffy, but I'm yeah. loving what they're doing with the graphics is trying to rebrand Auburn and not just the old Auburn and, you know, some of the things, but j- just kind of the new Auburn. So fresh, fresh. I think it's very fresh what he's doing. I can't really say that. If I, now, if it's me, I would do a lot more calling when it goes to, like, some of these four and five stars. But why waste your time if you know that if you got guys? Like, there's no way I'm going to get Jeff, some of these guys, right? Yeah. Okay, so he, he, I think he's being very pointed and very meticulous with how he handles his phone calls. But he's really more so worried about the Harson system, what he runs. Because at this point, if he runs it, they'll come. Yeah. If it works, they're going to come. People want to go to the league, point blank, period. And if you start to see how many people Harson has put in the league who may not have been four and five star recruits, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. And those guys, will, he'll get the four and five stars. It'll come. But like we said, and we, I think we're really in agreement on this, that you got to win. You have to. And I think that's where he's mainly putting his focus at. From what I'm hearing, he's putting his focus on making sure that the SEC knows his name. Brian Harson is the guy that had the offense that stymied Alabama that that beat that finally got over the Georgia hump Mm -hmm. and so I think that uh by taking that approach he will eventually be successful and I'm really interested to see how it works this year yeah and I mean uh I agree with you completely there's no point in fighting a battle of a kid in 2022 that you really have no shot at because like you mentioned these recruiting relationships have been harvested over years and mostly from the same guy not only position coach coordinator head coach we know there's attrition everywhere guys move on but it's tough to get in that battle it's tough to to convince a family especially if there's no prior relationship that hey i'm just coming in and and uh let me take your son you know and you've been recruited by this guy for three years and y'all have a relationship and really know each other Uh, but like you said you'll start to see it yield a little bit in 23 and then in 24 because it's a fair fight right that's when it's a fair fight and that's exactly right right. and again we'll see the theory but it all comes down to wins on the field the scoreboard talks we all know that because it's a whole heck of a a a big advantage when you can walk in and say hey we're going 10 and 2 i'm going to we're beating georgia we're beating alabama that's how you start to flip that script a little bit and uh you know what before we get to the offensive side of the ball i want to talk about tj finley um and and i do want to stay a little bit on the defense with Derek mason kind of nationally recruiting if you look at what auburn's done offering guys in wisconsin washington everywhere pretty much everywhere do you see that philosophy from Brian Harson as something that Auburn will continue to do because half of their staff is out there? Are they doing that kind of like a backstop because right now it's just tough to get those four and five star guys away from Bama, Georgia, and LSU, and you'd rather be able to recruit another big time guy that wants to come to the SEC as opposed to missing out and then having to get somebody on that lower tier uh, that you don't know if they can help you and it would have to be a surprise for them to help. <clears throat> I think what Harson is doing is starting to drop seeds for the imprint, right? Mm-hmm. So he's going out west, dropping that seed. Hey, have you thought about Auburn before? Guys, places that we n- have never been, that that don't that he may have had some success recruiting some guys for, that he can lean on some of his previous successes mm-hmm. <clears throat> and be able to say, hey, what did you, you know what I did there? Well, I got a, a, a even bigger a, a, the way I rate. I used to race that uh, that Camry. Remember how fast I was yeah. in that Camry? Well, look, you know, I just got a I got a Camaro now. Hey, yeah. so you come down here. We're gonna have the facilities. We're gonna have everything for you. Hey, it's in the south. You're gonna get be on TV. You get to play Bam every year. And so as those guys start to see nationally, if his plan works, you go out and you make you upset Georgia. You upset LSU. You upset uh, Bama. You upset somebody. Oh damn! You know what? That's the 
Yeah, oh, it's I've been, for real. Oh, it's for real down there. Okay, yeah. so that's when the guy from Wisconsin says, well, do I want to stay up here in Madison or do I want to go out here on Tumors and roll Tumors Corner with some of these hot chicks, right? Yeah, so, 100%. <laughs> no disrespect to Madison, never been, but I'm pretty sure that I've been to Auburn and it's pretty yeah. hot down there, right? The so, weather's a whole heck of a lot better, <laughs> I can promise you that. Amen, brother. So, like, <laughs> I, I think as far as what he's doing, I think that's, I think he'll continue that and I think he's planting seeds and I think, and, and like I said, from everything I've ever heard, I've talked to a high school coach that, uh, from my uh from my alma mater, uh, Banneker High School in College Park, and he was telling me how when Harson followed Malzahn the first time at Arkansas State, how he just started like basically there were may have been kids that didn't get recruited by Malzahn that Harson was like you know what let's try that kid let's try that kid let's try that kid and even if we may not get them those next kids from those following classes, when they see what we get at Arkansas State, then maybe we'll be on their radar. And I think it's the same thing he's doing now is just basically planting seeds, saying, you know what, when you get when you see us again, we'll be top 15, we'll be top 10. And you'll remember that. Same thing you do when you send out a letter to a seventh grader. So I think it's a good I think it's a good play. No, and he had success at Arkansas State, ends up to- taking the Boise State job after that and kind of building a little dynasty out there. And speaking about dynasties, you need to download one of the hottest apps right now if you have a kid that's being recruited, a uh, friend that's being recruited. If you're the prospect yourself or if you're a coach trying to find the best prospect, that's the Dynasty U app. You can get it anywhere you get your apps. It's unbelievable. It's like LinkedIn for recruits. So basically you fill a profile out. No more do you have to email the coach 20 times because I'm telling you that's the best way to get your kid not recruited, especially if he's on the fringe because college coaches do not want to deal with parents emailing them 300,000 times uh, a day and it doesn't work. So you need to download. It's called Dynasty U. It's totally free. You can fill out your whole profile, highlights, GPA, anything that goes into who you are that you want that coach to see. You download the app, form the profile. Coaches uh, at any level from any part of the country, you can check out any kid. It's concise. It's all right there. I've been in that war room, in that recruiting room where you have the guy that has to bring up huddle and then you got to go search this and search that. No, download the app. It's really, really easy. All the information's right there. It's called Dynasty. You find it anywhere that you get your apps. Apple, Android, anywhere, Google Play Store as well. It's great stuff. Won't be free for long, so make sure you check that out. We're here with Dukes the Scoop from Trust the Scoop. Uh, businessman, entrepreneur, does a little bit of everything. Uh, and Dukes, you know, we, we've been talking about the recruiting landscape a little bit, kind of who Brian Harson is uh, at Auburn. What about the staff that he put together? You know, we mentioned you have geographically half the staff is is basically from the west side of the country, kind of where Boise, uh, where Brian Harson's coming from. But then you had guys like Mike Bobo and Derek Mason, guys that, you know, Zach Etheridge, that understand the lay of the land down here that know the structure of it. Because it's one thing to be able to recruit. Doesn't matter where you're from, what you look like, what color you are, how tall you are. If you can recruit, you can recruit. Right. But it's a different thing to know the lay of the land, to be efficient, know where you have success, know where the kids are, and know the high school coaches. How do you think he filled out his staff? How would you grade him? Um, Let's say, I think he did a pretty good job as far as building out a staff that he could build, right? Mm-hmm. So... I don't see Derek Mason being at Auburn long. I don't either. So if you look at how he brought Schmetting in, right, you, you bring Schmetting in. So a lot of people don't know that Schmetting did a lot of the interviews for the defensive staff going in. Mm. So you think about it like there was no opportunity for some of these guys to be retained. When you make those type of decisions, you're basically going ahead and saying, like, these are my guys, but I'm going to have guys that do it my way. Mm. When you have guys that may have a brand already, that's not be that you can't really mold. You're not going to have your imprint on the program the way that you would want to. And the way that I see that Harson wants to run it, like me and you always joke around and say he kind of moves like a general, right? Yep. He wants his hand around everything. So he got guys that he could develop, even, even Lack, right? Lack is still a, a very new college coach. So he got somebody he could develop. You got a guy, the uh, the white Cornelius Williams, right? Yeah. Yep. Somebody that's, you, you can develop him. You can develop their the positional coaches. You can develop some of these guys. Burt Watts, you've got a relationship with him. He already, he already respects you in that capacity based on what you guys have gone through in the past. I think uh, they were rivals in uh, on the West on the West yep, Coast, right? Yep. So I think that he brought in a staff that he could mold. You got Nick Eason. You got guys that, that, that he has the NFL experience. And he was really, really particular about the type of guys that he brought in. You don't see so – a lot of people were upset about T. Will not being retained, right? Mm-hmm. Can you see somebody with that big of an individual brand on this staff? I mean, it's it's a, an interesting fit with the way Brian heads, and it's a great point. And and to your point, 
you know, we always talk about co cohesiveness in the locker room between the players and, and balance on your roster. You want to have balance in your staff, too. I mean, uh, every head coach will tell you half his job is coaching the coaches as well. You don't want a staff full of a bunch of old guys. Right. You don't, regardless of how good their minds are. It's just, it, it's an interesting dynamic. You want some of those young guys, like you said, that you can mold. You want your mentors that operate in a way that doesn't, not outshines not the word, but I think goes maybe outside of, of the narrative of the collective as, as a coaching staff to where, you know, a Derek Mason – uh, is it, is, is going to be a guy that, that does it his own way, but is still within that realm where it's not kind of outside of what Brian Harson wants to be a distraction, I guess you could call it right. from the collective as a group. So right. I, I think that's a great point. And, and I'm interesting to see, interested to see how this staff works together. You know, it's kind of the East meets West a little bit, kind of like eating, you know, black eyed peas and, and, you know, shrimp fried rice, I guess, <laughs> together in the same plate. But, uh, you know, when I look at this team and this, this roster, right. You know, we, we, can talk about TJ Finley here in a second. Okay. But it all comes down to up front. Right. That's where the game's won and lost. Regardless of what type of offense you run, even the air raid, you got to stay in front of people. Mm -hmm. Smoke draw's got to work for Mike Leach. What do you think about the personnel on the offensive line and the defensive line? And again, the portal's still active. They've right. done a lot on the defensive <coughs> line. Tony Fair, Marcus Harris, return Derek Hall, Colby Wooden, Lee Hunter's going to be a star. Mm -hmm. JJ Pegues moves over. But on the offensive line, I mean, They've got to go get a tackle. They've got to. They just they, they don't have them. You got to have guys that can stay in front of somebody because you got five junior offensive tackles right now on the roster, and you know you're hoping Brandon Council comes back healthy and, and maybe he can help you at tackle. But I don't really know if there's one guy that I trust to stay in front of a NFL defensive end consistently throughout the game. So the way I feel about that is is from what I do know about Harson is and how invested he is in his scheme. I see a lot of that. Uh, and we talked offline about it, like kind of like how. Was there anybody on Minnesota's offensive line when they beat us in a bowl game that could stand in front of Marlon Davidson or Derrick Brown and block them? I don't think so. But the way you scheme those guys mm -hmm. and you ride in that wide zone and you beat them to a spot instead of beating them in their face, that's how you beat those guys. That's how you neutralize that, that outer-worldly talent that you're going to see. That zone was invented. Right. Absolutely, right? <laughs> so we can't play you man up. We're just going to beat you to the spot. And that's exactly what I see Auburn – Having to do this year because you're not going to wake up and go get a uh, what, what, what's my guy from last year? Uh, from Georgia. Mims. Yeah, you know, yeah. like Mims is, isn't walking through that door, mm -hmm. and, he, and you may not get one of those guys for another two to three years. Mm -hmm. But as long as you can scheme it right and you can say, Hey, man, look, if you can get to this point before this guy gets there, don't let him get started. I always remember when Brandon Jacobs came to Auburn and he playing running back, and I used to ask a couple of the guys, I'm like, Man, how y'all even tackle that dude? And it was like, bro, you can't let them get started. Yeah. And that's the same thing the with some of these guys that when you're trying to block a guy, you can't let him get leverage. You can't let him get his hands on you. You got to beat him to a spot and get in the get in the way, bro. Yeah. Even if you got to do this, just get there yeah. and then let Tank make a decision. Okay, I got a guy right here. I have enough space for me to go here or here. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way that offensive line – I mean, no disrespect to the offensive line. I think they're really – they're going to try really hard. That was the word I'm looking for. They, tr they try really hard. Yeah. Tenacious. T mm, that yeah. effort, right? But Will Friend's going to get them hyped up. I mean, they're going to play hard. That's what you got to have because you, know? you don't – they, they, they don't have what some of these other guys have in the SEC, yeah. right? But I think the fact of them being – the cohesiveness that they're going to have, I think that the way that Harson teaches – and Will Friend teach, and I think Bobo, even with his success, they ran the ball. They they ran the ball so much in South Carolina. Like Kevin Harris is, was pretty good, but he like you know, think about Tank Bigsby behind what some of the things that they did last year in mm -hmm. South Carolina. So I can mm -hmm. see that working. And uh, even though we may not have the outer worldly talent that we have in some of the other positions, I think by being able to scheme it right, that we can we can have some uh, success running the ball. Yeah, and uh, you have to be malleable like that. And and sometimes there's things that you just have to do because I know deep down that Mike Bobo and, and Brian Harson want to run some gap scheme. They want to be able to run power. I mean, heck, just watch South Carolina last year. They want to be able to run counter. Uh, you want to be able to run things like that. But it's tough to go big on big when you don't have the horses. And listen, playing hard, that's a compliment. But a washing machine plays hard. You know, <laughs> I don't have to worry about a washing machine. You know, it breaks every now and then. But when, when it's working, it's playing hard. Right. I can still load, 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 load right. after it. And, and it's another thing to have talent. And, and not to knock them, but, but I don't want to beat around the bush. But as an offensive play caller, it's almost like having a quarterback that 
can only make the short throw or the vertical. You limit yourself in balance in the run game, zone scheme, gap scheme. You don't want to limit yourself, but sometimes you have to do it. That's why you're going to see a ton of mid zone. You're going to see a ton of outside zone, stretch, whatever you want to call it. I think you're going to see a little bit of gap scheme. I'm a huge fan of trap. I think it's one of the dirtiest plays uh, in the game. But you bring in a guy like TJ Finley to segue to that. Mm. That's we're kind of winding down. Mm -hmm. And to me, I, I always look at it, and we talked about this earlier, from a roster standpoint, roster structure standpoint. Bringing in competition for Bo Nix is good. Mm -hmm. Bo Nix needs to improve in the pocket. The offensive line needs to improve. Mm -hmm. And it's one thing to have a guy behind you that can actually push you. But I think they made this, and TJ Finley made this decision, for the long-term play. Because mm -hmm. him being a true sophomore, with Bo being a junior, Demetrius being a true freshman, you just balanced out your room. Because mm -hmm. what would have happened after? What would have happened without TJ Finley if Bo Nix goes down this year? you got to mm. put Demetrius Davis in there. Grant Lloyd can't do it. I right. say he can't do it. Can't throw you to a win. Right. Grant, uh, you, you would have to put Demetrius Davis in there. Right. But not even this next year, Dukes. Look at the year after that. What if Bo Nix has a horrible year and leaves? Mm -hmm. Or he has a great year and leaves? Right. So now you're stuck with Demetrius Davis, a retro freshman, then a true freshman holding Garner behind him? Right. To me, I think he just fixed his quarterback room, and that's what you have to do when you're trying to balance a roster. And T.J. Finley has some relationships in that locker room already. Really? That were telling him, hey, man, this may be you know a spot for you. So a lot of guys... Every, so, Bo Nix was the guy, is the guy, right? Mm -hmm. But there are some times that you – even last year, we kind of saw a ball boil over into the field where the frustration it's was like just – You saw the frustration. It's like, we don't have another option. So, you can do what the, you want to do yeah. because you know that there's nothing else that we can do. Yeah. So, now it kind of puts that competition level behind them. And, and even if there was an air of, uh, I guess, uh, 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 give me the word, where entitlement. Yes. Right? Even if he did have an air of entitlement, that goes away now. And the fact that you bring in a guy who started in the SEC last year, like once – so the team was mad about Gatewood, right? Yep. Even though we saw what Gatewood did sure. at Kentucky, they were still upset. And I think that – I still don't get this sometimes, but like, man, man, hey, man, just run the power with Gatewood, bro. Like, yeah. he's there for that, right? Yeah. But the team was upset about it, and they felt like, okay, this is our option. Whoop -de -whoop. So now you've got a guy – who may be able to rally some of the troops. And you know, at, at, at any football institution, who's the most popular guy in the locker room? That's backup quarterback. Backup quarterback. Yeah. So I think this is going to be really interesting. <clears throat> and Bo Nix finally gets a chance to really, really earn it. without. And now he can go ahead and shake that whole notion of him just being the guy and it being politics because my dad was this guy and this is who we wanted and such and such, such and such. You got to go back to Harson. Kudos to Harson. Yeah. Because that's a really, really slippery slope to bring in a guy of T.J. Finley's caliber when you already have Bo Nix, who is basically Auburn. He's Auburn, he's an Auburn legacy. Auburn, damn, they're Auburn royalty. Yeah. So it's like the, the fact that he did that, I think it really balances out the room, but I think it also is going to balance out the locker room. Yeah, it sends but a message. It sends a message like, hey, nobody's untouchable outside of T.A.N.K. And, yeah. and, 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 and – I care enough about our program as a whole, and if I'm going to preach that it's no man bigger than the whole or no part bigger than the sum, then I have to take care of every room regardless of how somebody may feel about it. Yeah, yeah, and, and talk about sending a message to your teammates uh, like we mentioned, and, and that way you're always earning it. And again, that, they say a coach's job is to push a player further than he can take himself. But when you create competition in a room, it's the Nick Saban special. Right. Why is Alabama so good at every – why are the young guys always so ready? Because they are bringing in guys that are not – not only want to compete, but are good enough to mm -hmm. compete. You can't mm -hmm. rest on – I mean, if you're a guy like Mitchie, you know, you know you're going to play and stuff like that. But then you look behind him and you're like, man, I mean, look at Xavier Williams. Like, look at some of these guys that they're bringing in. I mean, they're rolling them out every year. That's how you create and sustain success. And it goes back to that machine you were talking about, feeding that machine. Right. Uh, and, Dukes, before I let you plug your stuff, man, <coughs> i got to ask you, uh, how do you see Auburn doing this year? You know, you look at the schedule. you got uh, two, you know, cupcakes, call them what you want. Then you go to Happy Valley. Mm. Then you go to Death Valley. Mm. It's like the Valley Tour. Mm -hmm. And then you got the dogs at home. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's going to get awfully physical real quick there, Dukesy. What, what do you see Auburn doing? <sighs> man, honest to goodness, man, I, I, I could – if, I think if Auburn can win seven games, it's a very successful season. Mm -hmm. I think that's a successful season based on the fact of what we have, where we have to go, when we have to go there in succession, and the fact that you're just a whole new offense. 
anything over seven wins is an absolute win. And I think you see the thing. I think you start to see some of the things that we talked about coming to fruition if they get to that eight wins. But I think seven is a really good season for Auburn for what we have. Last year we went six in the ten in the twelve game. We probably would have won about seven or eight. So if you can keep continuity from a team where you lost so much, right? Where you lose players that may have come back if you would have had the old staff. If you lose out on some of the recruits that, that that we may have missed out on, and you can if you can take the blow, if you can weather the storm and still do with the same thing that the old staff did, has done, and you've added more to it, I think it's an absolute win. So I think seven games for me, I think seven games is a really good spot for Auburn. Yeah, and it's listen, the Death Star wasn't built overnight, and he's gonna have to build it because they got one in Athens, they got one in Tuscaloosa, Ooh. and Jimbo's damn sure building one in College Station, and that may be the most expensive one with all the money they got out there. <laughs> uh, but, Dukes, man, this is great. Tell everybody uh, kind of what you're doing, where they can find you on social media, and, and plug your stuff, brother. Uh, hey, if you're looking for me uh, on Twitter, uh, I still drop a few uh, gems every now and then, if, especially for Auburn fans, but I've kind of expanded into some other things. But follow me uh, at Dukes the Scoop on Twitter. Uh, Instagram, P Dukes LLC. You'll see me. That's more so my shoe collection and me at the beach, but it's still good, uh, a good look. And uh, outside of that, man, you know, keep supporting the J-Boy Show, man. Super proud of this guy. I even got a little bit of this. Oh, there we go. There we go. It's good, yeah. man. It's a good fit. Hey, I appreciate it, man. You know, uh, with me having a, a size 8 head uh, <laughs> on, on a size 4 body, I think uh, being able to have that flexibility is really good for me, man. <laughs> hey, man, that's why I made it adjustable. I, I got a, a pretty big head. Speaking of tanks, I got one on my shoulders. But, uh, no, Dukes, I really appreciate it, brother. We got to do this again. No, so, man. Uh, definitely. It's all love. Uh, and make sure you guys follow him. We appreciate y'all. Make sure you head over to thejboyshow.com. Get you some of that merch. It's a great price. These aren't too thick, too, during the summer. Uh, girls, that the T-shirts, a lot of the girls buy them to wear to bed. Uh, get them a size bigger. Uh, but, no, we appreciate you guys also. Subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify as well. We're going to continue to grow. You can donate, PayPal, Venmo as well. It's been another edition of the J Boy Show with Dukes the Scoop in person. Yes, sir. And we are going, going. Gone. The J-Boy Show is produced by David Cohn, Technical Director Dave Hammock, Creative Director David Culbertson, Audio Engineer Faison Sharif, Production Assistants Blaine Crane and Kyle Orr, Executive Producers Jake Crane, Vince Thompson, Steve Chamberlain, and David Cohn. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit our website, thejboyshow.com, for updates regarding our newest apparel and merch designs. Win the water cooler with The J-Boy Show.